Thank you. Thank you both. And it's an honor to be part of this. This is a great series. And uh, I, uh, I think uh, the outreach is, is um, phenomenal. Um, so it's a chance for me to give a little background on a disorder that's fascinated me for years and years. And I'm looking forward to the cases uh, that uh, will soon be presented. Uh, some disclosures as uh, indicated here. And just to note that I uh, will try to cover um, the very basic clinical aspects of, of uh, phosphate homeostasis, uh, hopefully point out some clinical uh, features of XLH as a cause of rickets in children, and also to point out that it's not just a childhood disorder, but has debilitating consequences in, in adult life. And then also to uh, uh, look at our therapeutic approaches and uh, um, particularly to focus on uh, uh, treatment not just in childhood but uh, as, uh, as would apply to the adult population as well. So, um, so the economy of phosphorus in the body is really the net sum of an interaction of phosphorus uh, uh, with a number of tissues. Um, we have to ingest it through the, uh, uh, our, what our dietary intake is, which uh, dietary intake generally not being a problem in, in most of the Western countries. Uh, we then have to absorb it across our intestine, um, and it is moving in and out of bone. And it's also, unlike calcium, substantial amounts are moving in and out of the intracellular space. Um, but Total body homeophosphate uh, homeostasis is really regulated at the kidney level. And it's uh, the regulation of renal phosphate retention and excretion that sets up the physiologic basis uh, for understanding X-linked hypophosphatemia. Now, the, the first paper that describes this condition goes back to the 30s um, with uh, the omnipresent Fuller Albright on the paper. Uh, uh, of the time, and and he uh, describes uh, uh, in beautiful detail the hypophosphatemia, the hyperphosphaturia, uh, the normal calcemia in this case, and um, attributes most of the disorder's uh, uh, basis to a resistance to vitamin D of interest. It, shown here are the x-rays of uh, this case when the boy was about seven or eight years old, but also I want to point out um, photographs of him when he was younger prior to the development of the severe bow deformity that you see in the x-rays. Um, you know, there's, there's not much femoral change here. There is the distal tibial bow that you, that you see persist, but there's also this very large and misshapen head that uh, often presents very early on in the disorder, and I would um, uh, speculate at least that uh, it's not entirely due to um, problems with phosphate homeostasis. This is just uh, some more recent cases that show you that kind of phenomenon. Here's a child in the first few months of life with uh, perhaps a little more subtle uh, uh, evidence of this problem with the bossing evident here and the elongated uh, uh, skull shape, um, and again, a high forehead here and bossing evident in this little girl, uh, both of which have X-linked hypophosphatemia. So what's the natural history of this disorder? We, we focus on, on the disease because of its skeletal consequences, and rickets in general is a disorganiz disorganization of the chondrocytes in the growth plate such that their linear columnar array becomes uh, rather chaotic, and they don't uh, align in a manner that allows for uh, regular organized growth. Uh, here, is a, here is a cartoon of that uh, 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 normal growth plate with the epiphysis and the, and the uh, metaphyseal bone shown, and uh, an accompanying um, uh, histological uh, slide of, of an animal's uh, growth plate. And again, you can see the, uh, the nice columnar array of chondrocytes, um, metaphyseal bone and epiphyseal bone here. 
in the rachitic bone in C, uh, you can see this expansion of the growth plate with this disorganization of the columns and the expansion in particular of the hypertrophic zone uh, where mineralization, where the mineralization process occurs. And with chronic exposure to this disruption, one begins to be able to see uh, disturbances radiographically uh, with this expansion uh, of, a, uh, of a metaphyseal edge that's evident on radiographs, um, both in uh, upper and lower extremities as shown here. Um, and then these mechanically translate into uh, lesions that can result in a bow or a knock knee deformity um, as shown in this uh, uh, young lady with rickets. So there's an accompanying bone disease and this is important because uh, the children have the rickets but they also have the accompanying osteomalacia and because the growth plates are no longer evident after completion of growth, adults technically can't have rickets but they have the residual deformities of their rickets and they also have the persistent osteomalacia. And we can think of osteomalacia in this context and that is um, we see bone turning over and in the normal bone uh, this uh, eroded bone, the old bone in dark blue uh, shown here creating um, a resorption of lacunae which fills in and mineralizes with this new bone which is in the lighter blue and then there's this um, uh, fine layer of uh, unmineralized osteoid that is uh, constantly being mineralized and a very small amount uh, is generally seen on biopsies as uh, shown in this biopsy uh, uh, over in the right side of the slide. Now in osteomalacia there's a failure to mineralize the new matrix. And so the new bone is shown here in a uh, limited compartment, whereas there's an expansion of this under or unmineralized uh, uh, matrix. And that can be seen on biopsy as shown here with the red staining osteoid uh, uh, in far excess of what you see in the normal bone, the mineralized bone showing uh, uh, appearing in the aqua staining um, uh, pieces uh, uh, in the upper uh, upper um, figure. Um, now, what what happens over time uh, with this lack of mineralization is one can get, particularly in cortical bone, these insufficiency fractures because of the softness. It's not a f often not a full thickness fracture, but a um, uh, cortical fracture, which uh, we often refer to as a uh, pseudofracture. When we're talking about children with this disorder, we uh, have to recognize that the serum phosphorus, which generally is the first laboratory test that prompts consideration of the disorder, um, we have to realize that the numbers change normally over the lifespan. And in the first year to two of life in particular, the mean serum phosphorus values are much higher than one sees later on uh, as shown here. Um, more and more reference labs are printing age-related phosphorus normals when they uh, give you your results, but it's not entirely universal yet. And we still hear of cases in which the uh, serum phosphorus level is misinterpreted as normal when it's in fact quite low. So to summarize, XLH is the most common heritable cause of rickets. It's due to renal phosphate wasting. Its manifestations include the rickets and osteomalacia that eventually evolve into skeletal deformity and short stature. Dental abscesses occur. We're not entirely sure why they occur. And this uh, variable craniosynostosis that we um, looked at uh, clinically earlier also is, um, uh, is something to be concerned about. Biochemically, the hallmarks are low serum phosphorus levels, a measure of urinary phosphate excretion, either the tubular reabsorption of phosphate or the renal threshold maximum for phosphate being low. And 
the co-defect in the generation of the active metabolite of vitamin D, that is low circulating 125-dihydroxy vitamin D levels. We also now know that this disorder is caused by, uh, genetically by a uh, mutation, a loss of function mutation in the FEX gene, the, the phosphate regulating gene with homology to endopeptidases on the X chromosome, but it is mediated by FGF23. And most importantly, the disease doesn't go away at the end of growth, but a number of lifelong complications evolve, including enthesopathy, osteophytes, almost a universal finding of uh, early arthritis, bone pain persists, there's a tendency for these patients to develop and have uh, uh, hard to control secondary hyperparathyroidism. The enthesopathy and osteophytes can uh, involve the longitudinal ligaments of the spine and very painful spinal steno st st uh, stenosis can occur, uh, something not that common but can be extraordinarily painful. And something that's kind of emerged more recently with closer scrutiny of, of these patients has been uh, a myopathy that uh, uh, is evident, uh, particularly evident when you see their responses to, to therapies. Um, in the older days when phosphate and vitamin D were given in high doses and perhaps not uh, monitored as intensively as, as practice has now evolved to, um, progressive renal disease often occurred. And uh, we have a number of patients that are resistant to, ther are resistant to initiating therapy because of uh, uh, having had a relative in the past uh, actually die with progressive renal failure. Um, this is a child in which uh, an osteotomy was required, um, which is not infrequent for bowing and knock knee issues, but uh, this one was for torsion of the, of the lower tibia. And sometimes the bow defect can correct nicely with therapies, but the uh, torsion is more difficult to control and the torsion can result in severe intoing, um, difficulty running, difficulty participating in athletic activities. Um, and these, uh, uh, these problems can, can lead to uh, uh, what require fairly invasive surgeries. We've mentioned the short stature. This is just uh, from the older literature showing a population of children that uh, have a variety of uh, slightly different patterns of, of growth, but by and large, all quite short. Um, again, just to uh, re uh, emphasize the fact that there are treatment-related complications that have historically emerged in, in adulthood, and there's poorly understood complications that do complicate uh, adult life, uh, all listed here, uh, which we've reviewed uh, uh, in, a, in a previous slide. Just to show you a picture of what some of this enthesopathy can look like, these are um, uh, X-rays from a 52-year-old man who's beginning to calcify his Achilles tendon. You can see mineralization beginning to march up the tendon here. Uh, the calcaneus is one of the first bones involved uh, in terms of developing the osteophytes, and you can see uh, this, what turns out to be a very characteristic uh, 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 configuration of the um, of the calcaneal bone, but bone spurs uh, showing up here in variety uh, of sites. Um, the same man uh, also uh, at the knees has these problems, is beginning to calcify up the quadriceps tendon, has uh, osteophytes in various locations that can restrict motion and be quite painful. If one looks at an entire cohort, uh, you can see that uh, uh, on the y-axis here are the number of sites involved in a skeletal survey, and um, virtually it's present in this entire cohort by uh, the early 20s, and just uh, becomes more and more extensive over age, and it's a, a fairly universal phenomenon. Um, this was not a statistically significant difference, but there's a general trend for the males at a given age to have more sites of involvement than the than the females. I mentioned earlier 
the myopathy that uh, occurs in this condition. And this uh, is a, a data from an animal study in which we uh, uh, subjected rats to a low phosphorus diet and uh, dropped their serum phosphorus from uh, control rat level at six to a, uh, a, a, a plasma phosphorus of two milligrams per deciliter in the low phosphate diet ones. And then we could also show by giving them a, um, uh, and, and what, on my thing, this is in the way, there we go. You can see that the uh, uh, generation of ATP is also different uh, in the phosphate-deprived animal versus the normal animal. But if we take that phosphate-deprived animal and give a phosphorus infusion for an hour before doing this uh, ATP uh, synthesis study done, done by uh, P31 NMR spectroscopy, you can uh, see you can restore and even overshoot the ATP generation based on providing the phosphate. So we think this is a potential um, has potential as a um, uh, as a target for therapy and may explain some of the limited activity, perhaps more so than even some of the skeletal problems that can occur in this group. Now, um, we then, after that rat study, took a uh, uh, human with uh, a hypophosphatemic disorder and subjected uh, him to NMR spectroscopy of the gastroc muscle and. Uh, uh, he, to avoid vitamin D issues in this, we took a patient that did not have vitamin D uh, deficiency or, or uh, incapacity to generate 125. He had a transporter mutation, but had hypophosphatemia on, on that basis. And at the baseline state, his uh, serum phosphorus was low at two, and his um, ATP generation was low compared to these orange circles, which are... Uh, uh, the same um, kind of study done in a control population. And when we gave this patient a low dose of phosphorus, we could um, uh, increase his ATP generation slightly without much of a change in his serum phosphorus level, but at higher doses of phosphorus, we could show that uh, we could bring his uh, ATP generation into the, uh, into the same range as the uh, normal population. So, how does this hypophosphatemia happen? We now know that the disorder is mediated by the endocrine growth factor, FGF23. Um, it's secreted by the osteocyte. Its regulation is disrupted because of the loss of function effects. The reason that the loss of function effects, also an osteocyte protein, generates the dysregulation of FGF23 is, is still unknown. Uh, the FGFs uh, were a surprising uh, finding as a mediator of this disorder because we generally think of them as paracrine factors, as shown here in the red on this family tree of the FGFs. The unique uh, three, or, or the small family of three endocrine FGFs, uh, 23, 21, and depending on if you're a man or a mouse, 15 or 19, um, differ uh, from the... Um, paracrine FGFs in their C terminus in that they do not have uh, a heparin binding domain and they escape uh, into the circulation. FGF23 is metabolized and uh, 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 the active intact hormone uh, is cleaved at a specific site into an inactive N and uh, C terminus. The configuration of the FGF receptor clotho complex allows for distant uh, uh, re recognition of the circulating FGF23, and clotho is being highly expressed in kidney results in uh, uh, FGF23 uh, being a prime effector of these renal functions uh, that we're talking about. And the, uh, the system sort of uh, can be looked at in cartoon form like this with the main uh, cell of, of, uh, uh, of the story being the proximal renal tubular cell that has all the machinery to affect these changes. It has on the basal lateral surface the FGF receptor. It has in the mitochondria the enzymes that convert 25 
uh, hydroxy D, the precursor of the active form, uh, to the active 125D, and also on the apical surface, the sodium phosphate transporters. And when the FGF receptor, together with clotho, are present, and the endocrine FGF FGF23 recognizes this complex, the subsequent effect on the nucleus is to generate less message for synthesis of the transporters as well as less message for the generation of the active form of 125D, also stimulating the catabolic enzyme, the 24-hydroxylase, to uh, uh, rid the supplies of 25D more readily than uh, uh, otherwise. And to contrast this with the other patient that we discussed here, uh, we um, uh, did our studies on the muscle um, in on muscle in a patient with uh, hypophosphatemia due to mu direct mutations in these transporters. Um, that disorder is a separate disorder um, termed. Hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria. So um, I'm going to finish with a little bit about treatment, and just want to point out that uh, uh, we think starting early is uh, important for getting the optimal growth out, uh, outcomes. There's good data showing that if you begin treatment before four years, and now even more recent ones before two years, that you get better growth outcomes. We try to start treatment within the first six months. Um, the traditional therapy for this disorder has been the combination of calcitriol and phosphate. We've used doses uh, comparable to that shown on the slide here. And we treat to the growth in the skeleton and uh, also employ the ALK-FOS level, but we do not try to entirely normalize the serum phosphorus because that generally results in overtreatment because of the uh, way that you do not correct the basic defect. You just are trying to compensate for those phosphate losses with the provision of uh, quite a bit of, of phosphorus. Alternate strategies have more recently been employed, and the one I'll discuss here is to inhibit the FGF23 action uh, via an antibody to FGF23, uh, such that if this uh, antibody, is, such that if FGF23 is tied up via antibodies, it will not interact um, efficiently with the uh, receptor clotho complex. And such a trial in uh, children comparing an every four week to every two week protocol uh, shows here the, um, in green the effect of getting an injection of this antibody every four weeks, uh, eventually uh, bringing peak serum phosphoruses above the lower limit of normal, um, but with a sawtooth pattern that results in a peak and trough, whereas if you give the antibody every two weeks, you uh, get a very steady serum phosphorus level and uh, uh, you can maintain the values in the uh, 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 higher ranges, uh, uh, hopefully adequate to maintain um, or correct the, the, the skeleton. And here are, in fact, x-rays of a child that had been treated with calcitriol and phosphate for um, roughly seven years, and you can see uh, at 40 weeks and then at 64 weeks, the gradual filling in of rachitic deformities that are uh, uh, evident on these, on these films. Um, when you quantitate this by a, a, a score of the x-ray, and in this case, the higher the score, the worse the rickets, you can see that the entire population improves uh, um, most of it occurring uh, in the first 40 weeks of exposure, those getting the drug every two weeks in these studies um, uh, had a slightly higher magnitude of improvement early on than those getting every four weeks. But when this cohort was changed over to an every two week group, they sort of caught up to comparable um, improvement. Um, with respect to adults, um, we offer treatment to uh, those adults that uh, are uh, sufficiently uh, affected with symptoms that um, that um, uh, we can can see a, a benefit to the patient has to be willing to undergo the monitoring that uh, therapy entails. 
um, we almost always advise therapy a uh, minimum of six months prior to elective orthopedic surgery for these patients. Um, we've picked up a number of them because they come in uh, some undiagnosed, but with uh, uh, their children who are getting a new diagnosis and it's recognized that they too have similar problems. And we have to date uh, not been able to solve the problem of uh, some of the changes that take a long time to, uh, uh, to develop, such as the enthesopathy. Uh, at least with the standard of care therapy uh, over the past uh, 40 years using calcitriol and phosphate, the persistence of um, enthesopathy has continued and been a big problem for many of these patients. The adults have also participated in trials of the antibody, and one can see here uh, because of the lack of consensus of treatment of adults historically, a placebo group was uh, uh, used as a comparator. You can see the serum phosphoruses don't change with placebo, whereas a very rapid uh, increase in the serum phosphorus from low to normal levels occurs. And at 24 weeks, uh, the placebo group was crossed over to also receive uh, durosumab, the antibody, and they then began to mirror what happened in the first six months of the study uh, in those originally treated with the uh, antibody. Um, it turns out that a, a large number of these patients recruited in the study had fractures and pseudofractures at baseline. Um, some of these were not symptomatic. Uh, they were predominantly lower extremity. And um, in a review of the films, uh, at baseline, they were the, the sites where fractures occurred were monitored at 12 and 24 weeks. And in uh, this initial adult study, the uh, um, healing of the fractures and pseudofractures was uh, upwards to 45 to 50 percent um, after six months of therapy, whereas it was about 7 percent in the placebo group. And as one continued on for another uh, 24 weeks, um, upwards to 60 to 65 percent of the fractures healed with the antibody. And when the placebo group was crossed over, they too began to show a uh, change much like the first six months of the uh, um, burosumab treated group. This is just a picture of some of those uh, uh, pseudofractures and what they look like uh, at week 24. Now this is a disorder that requires uh, a whole team to take care of the patients. We know the medical piece is important. Um, other Strategies that have been employed have included uh, growth hormone, suppression of parathyroid hormone. We've mentioned the surgical um, uh, uh, osteotomies that have occurred. A less invasive guided growth technique has been important. Sometimes the craniosynostosis can be sufficiently severe to require neurosurgery. The dentists are important because of the abscesses. We found that physical therapy is very important. Many of the adults, by the time they're in their 40s, begin to lose hearing. Some get Meniere's, uh, tinnitus, dizziness. Um, a rheumatologist can be helpful in that group as well. So it's a multi-system disorder that requires uh, a team of, of, of uh, players. Um, so we've kind of focused on the FGF23 mediation of hypophosphatemia, but uh, going back to the um, problems in skull in the, in the program that uh, um, guides fu uh, suture fusion in the developing skull, uh, there's perhaps FGF23 mediated functions that are independent of phosphate in 125, and there may well be functions of FEX that are independent of FGF23. We know that a number of the bone proteins are found to be elevated in the uh, skeleton of patients with XLH. So the, the story may be much more complicated than um, a simple um, phosphate story. We do know that correcting the serum phosphorus makes a tremendous difference in the osteomalacia and the rickets, and that has made a, a, a major difference in, in many of the um, functional features of the disorder. I'll uh, 
uh, in the interest of time, uh, not um, review uh, a readout of the summary slide, but we'll uh, turn this over to the others for uh, the cases. This is the uh, um, this is the website for the XLH network, which I would uh, suggest that uh, you pass <laughs> on to your patients because it's been a very uh, um, it's been a very useful uh, support organization for many of the families. <laughs> 